Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, just before we start, uh, just some housekeeping. If you could use the chat feature uh, to uh, talk back to us, um, especially if you need anything repeating, uh, if we speak too quickly. Uh, and also if you have any questions, there's a questions area and we will uh, come to those at the end of the webinar. Uh, don't worry if you don't have any questions, we've already had some submitted uh, prior to the event. So, uh, whether you're sat on your sofa, in the office, or hiding in the bathroom in order to get some peace and quiet, uh, sit back and relax, and we will guide you through our audio solutions for effortless communication. So, uh, Julian, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, people out there in sofa land. My name's Julian Simpson. I am a market development manager for the Nordic region, which means I am covering Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Iceland. Thank you, Julian. Um, my name is Geraint, and I am a applications engineer based in Copenhagen. I'm probably one of a few people who quite likely respond to any questions or problems that you might have in future with any of our products. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions you have right now, but if not, then feel free to reach out to us after the webinar and we'll get back to you. So let's just quickly go through the agenda today. Uh, we will begin with a quick rundown of the Shore ecosystem. Uh, we'll go through what products um, we have. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the second part, we will go and go through the, um, the different mics and uh, how they work, uh, which ones that we've got available. Uh, later on, later on after that, we will show you a couple of videos uh, where we'll demonstrate uh, the microphones in different sized rooms. Section four, where we will be discussing um, how to choose the right microphone for your room. Uh, section five will be regarding the acoustics in those rooms and how it will affect your choices. And then we'll finish off with the key takeaways. And then, of course, after that, we will have uh, questions and answers. So, uh, Julian, would you like to begin with uh, talking to us about which microphone they should use? Uh, thank you, Geraint, for that introduction. What Geraint didn't say, he, he's also probably the only person in Shure that will be able to answer your questions if you ask him in Welsh. He's a, a native Welsh-speaking person. I'm British, like Geraint is. I've actually, though, been living in Copenhagen for more than half my life, so I'm like fully integrated into the Nordic scheme. When I'm out and about uh, in the Nordic region, people ask me quite simply, I have a room, which mic should I use? And my answer is quite glibly, it depends. It's a, it's a relevant question, but it, it's very similar to those of you who maybe work in uh, pro audio or have connection with that. I have a band, which mic should I use? I've shown here a, a small selection of the different microphones that Shure offers for music industry can see a big square one sitting down that's designed to go into a kick drum. You would not use that on a person. It's too big, it's too heavy. And conversely, the small head-worn microphones on the right-hand side, if you put those into a kick drum, they probably get overloaded and you wouldn't get the bass out of them. So uh, I have a band, which mic should I use? It depends on what you're trying to capture in the situation. And exactly the same story for a room. Which room do you have? It depends on what you want to capture and the situation. Hopefully, by the end of this webinar, we'll have the answers to all of these for you. Geraint, would you tell us about some recent innovations in the Shure product line? Uh, and then after that, I'll explain a little bit about how they work. Yeah, will do. Uh, those of you who are interested, the Welsh word for microphone is microphone. So you're kind of halfway there learning already. So a little bit of uh, background, a little bit of history. Uh, we love our history here at Shaw, um, but we're not going to go out too far. <laughs> Only as far as 2016, when Shaw introduced the, um, I guess, the first in the range of MXA microphones. Um, we've always been uh, trying to push um, innovation and bring new innovative products to the market. Um, the MXA was uh, one of our uh, more advanced uh, array microphones, which is unequaled in design, performance, and support. That's me. And uh, we're 
quite pleased to say that the MXA microphones surpassed customer expectations. Um, you could say that microphones finally grew up. So in 2016, as, as we saw, we had the, um, the actual microphones. And then in 2018, uh, we introduced the IntelliMix P300. Um, as you can see in the images there, that in 2003, in order to achieve the same level of DSP, you needed a pair of human hands uh, to uh, push buttons and move dials. And it was probably a bit cumbersome and uh, hardly the, the best use of anyone's time. Uh, about 10 years later, we managed to put all of that into a uh, more compact uh, arrangement, but that still needed a little bit of interaction to move some dials. So the P300 has taken all of that uh, DSP technology and put it into uh, one hardware processor. And this, uh, this really does handle the next generation of microphones um, with ease deployment and simple connectivity. Um, for all your conference conference spaces uh, around the world, um, the uh, the IntelliMix P300 um, brought the Shure networked audio encryption between the microphone and the DSP. Uh, for those of you who are concerned with uh, security and keeping your conversations private, uh, this was a industry first. Um, and we could say that the MXA910 and the MXA310, along with the P300. Uh, really have changed the front end um, of the premium conferencing uh, area. But as typical with Shure, we continue to push our boundaries in everything that we do. So in uh, 2020, uh, quite a memorable, memorable year for, for many other reasons, uh, we, uh, we introduced the IntelliMix Room application. And uh, today, I guess you would say that you could encounter innovation in uh, further innovation in DSP processing. And um, you could say that this has really turned the uh, expectations upside down. Because as you move from conference space to conference space, you will probably experience some familiar hardware. But now you'll probably start noticing that there are things missing from the room. And you uh, will probably find that you're expecting to see um, such things as um, amplifiers or, uh, I guess, um, sorry. Uh, Julian, I was just wondering if you could just chip in on this. I seem to have had a connection issue. I'm with you here, yes. Yeah, <clears throat> you're saying if you went into a room uh, after we'd introduced IntelliMix room to the market and they'd been deployed in a, in a situation, you wouldn't find the P300 anymore. You wouldn't find some of the black boxes because this is software-based DSP. Yes, thank you, Julian. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, <laughs> back now. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, we realized that the, the best way to make use of the, the space was to incorporate an existing uh, device such as a PC, uh, which is already being used uh, to run the soft codec. And uh, by installing the IntelliMix Room app onto this PC, uh, we, we save a lot of space in terms from uh, bulky uh, rack mount uh, hardware and um, make it all simple and, and easy to use for the, the end user as well. Um, the IntelliMix Room app is quite a modest uh, application and the requirements are based on the same requirements that something like Zoom or Teams uh, would use, uh, such as a, a Windows 10 professional operating system, a four core i5 processor with eight gig of RAM and a solid state drive. Um, these requirements aren't uh, over and above anything else that you're probably used to. And if uh, Julie could just help me out with moving the slide along. One of the uh, areas that we've continued to innovate in and look to capitalize on is the different form factors of uh, microphone. 
And as you can see here, we've introduced the MXA 710. They, they are in two form factors, uh, two foot or four foot or 60 centimeters and 120 centimeters, if that makes more sense to you. And the, the MXA 710 was introduced as a uh, different option because sometimes the table array, such as the 310, uh, or the ceiling array, the 910, uh, just didn't fit the criteria. So we have now introduced this as a different option. Incidentally, we have also brought in a um, Dante-enabled power over Ethernet uh, ceiling loudspeaker because uh, we've noticed that uh, the comms room of the future really does need an end-to-end -end solution. And the MXN 5C uh, is the answer to that uh, question of how do we provide that end-to-end -end solution. So the MXN 5C is uh, mounted in the ceiling and doesn't require any further application and is powered over PoE, which is pretty impressive and opens up all sorts of possibilities for your solution. And there we are, that's the current ecosystem of the MXA microphone range. Uh, we have all the various microphones, we have a loudspeaker, and we have the sure tailored processing built in, uh, which is designed to get your equipment sounding its best without much effort. So Julian, I'm just gonna hand over this to you now, as you seem to know more about this. Um, how do our microphones work? Thank you, Geraint. I realized the problem, I'm just gonna share this with you. When I move my mouse, it moves away the, from your mouse. So that's where we are. So I should um, keep my mouse still. Excellent, <laughs> put that out then. Yeah. How do our microphones work? Uh, the MXA 910 Cine microphone that Garant was describing has actually got 100 microphones in it. So when you say mics here, this mic's plural, both uh, the different in the range and also the number of microphones in the unit. Uh, the little 310 has got eight microphones in it and the 710 has 30 or so microphones in it. Why do we need so many microphones? Well, here I've, I've pictured two gentlemen in a meeting and they've not got headphones on, so clearly they're using their ears to hear what's going on. Those of you who have seen some of the Harry Potter films might remember that J.K. Rowling invented a device called extendable ears. And extendable ears allowed people to be in one room and listen in to another. And that's effectively what we're trying to do here. These uh, people are in a meeting room and they're wanting to listen to some people, could be the other side of the wall, but in, in a faraway place. So we're trying to extend their ears for them. If you listening to me now in a, in a room, or maybe you've got headphones on or earphones, if you actually blocked up one of your ears like this, now you would be listening in mono, and suddenly you would hear all sorts of artifacts. You'd hear external noise, maybe you're living somewhere near a road, you'd suddenly hear the car noise, you might hear the ticking of a clock suddenly very loudly, or the room acoustics that you're in. Uh, that's because the cocktail party effect has been masked. So our two ears are able to hear the difference in the arrival of time of sound coming in certain directions, uh, and the back of the ear shades the, the high frequencies in a different way to coming in the front, so we can also find the direction like that. Clearly, if you're listening to somebody at a far end and it's coming through just a loudspeaker, you have no reference. So what we're trying to do is to clear the path as, as best possible from the far end to your ears with a high quality microphone that is also directional so that we're not listening as if we've got one ear open but we're actually listening with two or more ears this is why we have 100 microphones in the mxa 310 as uh, 910 and down to eight in the 310 so it's all about the pickup pattern as, as far as we humans are concerned our pickup pattern changes as we move our head around that we're changing where we're listening to and also where I'm actually sending my voice. So where and how the microphones pick up the sound is the emulation of where and how we as, as people listen to stuff. So now I'm going to focus on to the MXA 910. 
as I said, it's got 100 microphones in it, and these 100 microphones make an array. It's, it's a square array, and you do some very fancy maths on it, and in that way, we can find out which direction sound is coming from. So we're able to tail up to eight virtual microphones pointing down from the ceiling, and you can move them around the room in, in virtual space, and then they will listen only to that area where they are pointing and to nothing else. So if you have one array, and only one lobe uh, working, you can point that maybe at the chairman of a meeting, and then anybody else who speaks won't be heard. They, they, will, they will be heard slightly, but not to the degree of being uh, heard clearly, because it's only be their reflection off the wall or something, not the direct sound. Because it's all virtual and by maths, we, we change the numbers, we're actually able to change the pan and the tilt. So if, if the lobe is here, I'm able to move the lobe up and down and left and right in the room. It's a bit like a flashlight. If you were sitting on the ceiling with a torch and you were moving the torch around, wherever the beam of light was falling is where the microphone would be able to pick up the sound. As I said, the, the 100 elements can create up to eight independent lobes. Uh, the microphone signals, once they've been crunched by the, the main algorithm, go into our DSP suite. That allows to have noise reduction to a certain degree. So uh, if I was tapping the table a little bit hard, we would be able to reduce that. It has uh, automatic gain control. If I was perhaps speaking too quietly in a room, it would be able to increase the volume. There would be automatic echo cancelling. So uh, you don't hear your own sound coming back through the loudspeakers from the far end. Automatic mixing of the eight, so all eight, if you had them working simultaneously, they would not be on at all at once unless you really wanted them to. So that means uh, the chairman might speak. If somebody else in the meeting room down at the far end spoke, the chairman's microphone would be taken down in level and the other person's would be taken up. And you would get this seesaw effect between the two. That's done automatically by the, the DSP mixer, the D <coughs> digital signal processor. If you wanted to change the timbre of the sound, there is equalization on each channel. Maybe uh, you have a room which has uh, quite a boxy sound and you wanted to remove some of the, the bass notes, so you can change that. Or conversely, if there was a, a lot of fan noise which was creating high frequency whistle, you might want to dampen that down. So each channel has equalization. To get to and from the microphone in the ceiling, I think Garant mentioned the PoE, the power over ethernet. Ethernet is a standard uh, cabling system, which most offices and premises have nowadays. You only need the one cable. Through that cable, we send the power to the microphone from the switch. And then the audio signal is digitized in the microphone, all eight channels plus whatever else control data we would want to send back and forth, and also put into the Ethernet. So one cable to the ceiling to the MXA910, sent on a proprietary Dante system, that's used uh, throughout the industry now to transport sound signals to and from devices. The power of Ethernet I mentioned, available in black, white, and aluminium, depending on the, the color scheme or the interior that you're trying to match it in. Uh, and you can actually have spray painted the front grill if the three standard colors weren't, or standard finishes weren't suitable for you. And then lastly, there is an LED on it, so if you're in the room and uh, you wanted to know whether the microphone is on or off, you can arrange it to look up and say if it's green, it's on, and it's red, it's off, or vice versa. Uh, when I worked in the BBC, a red light meant the microphone was on, but nowadays it normally means the microphone is muted. You can also make that any color. You, is that right? Sorry, you, can make, you can also make it any color you like. Yeah, that's true. That sounds like a Pink Floyd song to me, any color you like. Yes, you, you can, can do that. <laughs> well, I, I have to admit, the, the microphone I'm using now is actually a Shure MXA 310, and my mute color is purple, so that normally when I'm sitting at the desk, it's not a red light that's shining in my eyes, but a slightly dim purple one, which kind of matches the decal with the rest of the stuff that's going on. So that's that right. correct. <laughs> <laughs> the MXA 710, you can see this is a, a long, thin array, the microphone. So instead of having 100 elements in it, it has 30-odd. Uh, spaced in the correct mathematical spacing. It's not able to produce beams of, of microphones. It's actually producing donuts, if you like. They're toroids that are coming out of it. Uh, it's mounted on a wall. The toroid goes virtually back through the wall and in again, but of course there's no sound coming through the wall, so it won't pick it up. So these, the toroid is pointing out into the room, and in this diagram here, I've shown that uh, 
there are three lobes out of the four possible selected for the short one, uh, and they're pointing left, right, and centre to cover the horseshoe. If you take the long version of the MXA710, that is the 120 centimetres, four feet, that has up to eight lobes. But as I said, these lobes are, are more donut shaped, toroidal rather than flashlights. Similar to the uh, MXA910, the same DSP code is inside this one with automatic muting, mixing rather, channel equalization. Dante transport power over Ethernet again, so you just need to rate one cable to it and you're getting power and sound, and available in the same finishes, black, white, and aluminium. The MXA910 is traditionally mounted on the ceiling, uh, and it can come with a ceiling mount and also a, a drop plate if you want to hang it from wires or put into a suspended ceiling. The MXA710, the picture I've shown you here, is for a, a, a flat mount on top of a uh, a crescendo, for example, or underneath a monitor. You can also mount them vertically, so not just necessarily horizontally like a sound bar, but also vertically beside a screen on the wall. Uh, and you can also put them on the table, either flush mount or sitting like this at the end. So it's a very versatile microphone, the MXA710 producing the toroidals. The MXA310, shown here in the center of a table. Uh, have six people sitting around it, and you can probably see that there are four microphone lobes going out from this one. There's the gentleman left and right, who've got one each, and then the people top and bottom, they are sharing lobes. So the MXA310 has also steerable coverage, very similar to the MXA910 from the ceiling. It only has four lobes because of the number of microphones that are contained in it. Contains the same DSP code as the other microphones I've shown, with the same automatic mixing and equalization of the channels. Again, it has Dante, power over Ethernet, available black, white, and aluminium. I've never seen anybody actually change the color of this from anything from black or white or aluminium. Black is very popular. And then the LED ring around the side here is green, also can be configured in very many different colors, and also be configured to show which lobe is on, so you know who is talking in the room. If you want to mute this one, you just have to reach out and touch it, uh, and that will mute the microphone. Although nowadays, of course, we're asked for non-touch systems, but that is a possibility with this particular microphone. You touch it and it mutes itself. The other two, you would need to mute either from the device uh, software that is hosting it, whether you're using a Zoom or a Teams or whatever VC program you're using, or we have got a power over Ethernet mute button, which can be mounted in the room somewhere appropriate, which you touch, which will then mute the system. Grind the demos. What are we about to hear? So yeah, um, we will be now showing you a number of uh, videos that we've, uh, we've, we've made. Um, they will be showing you uh, how each size room, so large, medium, small, uh, would be uh, set up with the various uh, microphones from the range. Um, so here we have the schematic of the what we had in the large, what we'll have in the large room, and uh, you can see there's a number of microphones and P300s which are all rooted into a PoE switch. And this is then connected via Dante to a uh, laptop, which is recording the uh, entire session. We also connected a webcam uh, to be used as like a, a baseline reference. And the uh, USB microphone on the laptop itself, uh, sorry, on the camera itself, uh, which we only use briefly just to give an example. Before we start, uh, some of you may be familiar with this screen. Uh, if you're not, this is what we call the signal path, um, which is a bit like the, the brain of the MXA microphone. Luckily, you don't need to be a brain surgeon uh, to understand it, but uh, hopefully you can uh, see this and understand that you have eight lobes for the MXA 910, and we have turned off the equalizer 
Um, we've turned off the uh, automatic echo cancellation. The noise reduction is set to low and the automatic gain control is off. And then we've just routed it directly through the auto mixer and then straight out via Dante to the PC. We did this because we wanted to minimize any of the DSP treatment of the audio signal so that you're able to um, get an unaltered uh, signal, an unaltered signal uh, that you can listen to. Likewise, for the 710, um, the six lobes um, were the input. And again, we've turned off the equalizer, AEC, noise reduction, and AGC. And again, directly connected via Dante to the PC for recording. And here we have the three uh, MXA 310s. And the only difference with this is that we were using the auto mix of the uh, P300 um, to select the best microphone to use, uh, depending on uh, where uh, the person stood. So, um, Julian, uh, before we start, maybe you might want to describe the uh, the room space a little bit. Thank you, Geraint. Uh, <clears throat> Geraint's just shown you the the technical layout uh, and also a schematic diagram of the microphones that were in the uh, in the rooms. What I've shown here now is a picture of a, the room where the, the following video we're about to watch was actually recorded. Uh, the plan view shows you that there's a table, seats around it. On the center of the table, we had the three MXA 910, 310 microphones. The 910 is hanging from the ceiling and some 710s placed as well, uh, I believe, in the ceiling in this one. The room is four meters wide, eight meters long, and the ceiling height just under three meters. Uh, the office table you can see is melamine, and there's carpeting on the floor, glass on the walls, uh, and otherwise it's a fairly standard large conference space that we, we would encounter every day. So let's watch the video. I'm going to turn my video off, and we will see a live demo. Hello and welcome to Shure. We're filming today in some rented spaces in a co-working environment in Paris at La Défense. Um, we have decided to choose these rooms because they are generic rooms. They're not the best acoustically. They've got metal walls, metal ceilings, typical tables, windows in front of me, carpet on the ground. Acoustically, these are not perfect. There is no acoustical treatment, but we thought, you know what? This is the typical type of room that integrators are faced with every day, day in, day out, where no acoustics has been taken. So you know what? Let's see what we can do in this room and what we can. This room here is the large room. We've got a number of different seating arrangements around here, and we will be showing you a little map, a little plan to give you an idea of dimensions of the room. The purpose of these videos is to allow you to listen and hear what our different microphone solutions are like. We are using a webcam with an integrated microphone as a baseline for the recording. And then we will also be recording simultaneously our MXA 310 solution, our MXA 710 solution, and the MXA 910 ceiling microphone solution, of course. Okay, what we've done is on this table, we've got a fairly large table. We've decided to place three MXA 310s on the table. The three different mic microphones are configured slightly differently. The two MXA 310s at both ends of the table are configured with three cardioid lobes, and the MXA 310 in the middle is configured with four lobes capturing both sides of the table. The auto mix output of these three MXA 310 is then fed via the Dante network into a P300, which is the Shure Audio DSP, and we've recorded a single output of that Shure P300, and that is what you are listening to now. On the ceiling, we've got, of course, the MXA MXA 710 solution. In this room, based on the size of the table and the number of seats in the room, we've decided to place two of the MXA 710 in a two-foot arrangement. We could have placed an MXA 710 four-foot in the center, and that would have covered the table, the room, beautifully, but we've reserved that place for our MXA 910, which you will listen, you will hear in just a few seconds. 
The MXA 710s are both configured equally. We've configured them with three different lobes. So we've split the table roughly in half, which three lobes with each 710. And these six lobes are then being sent via the Dante network to the Shure P300. The Shure P300 does the auto mix, and then a single output is what is being recorded, and that is what you are listening to now. You are now listening to me coming from the MXA 910 ceiling microphone. The MXA 910 is configured with eight lobes. We've configured it with three lobes on either side of the table and a single lobe at each extremity of the table. These eight lobes are sent via the Dante network to the Shure P300. The Shure P300 does the auto mix, applies noise reduction, and then we are using a single output of that, and that is what we have recorded, and that is what you are listening to. Now I'd like to give you an opportunity to listen to the three different microphone solutions in a more actual, let's say, um, environment. Because in a meeting, people typically don't just sit in the same place at the whole time. They often stand, walk around the room, one side of the, diff of the room, and then of course they'll move across the different room, they'll go to a whiteboard, and maybe they'll do some kind of a presentation. They may move over to the video screen in order to point something out if they don't necessarily have a video pointer. And this is to show you that no matter where we are in the room, the autofocus technology built into the MXA 710 and the MXA 910 allows the microphone to track the speaker and follow them, not follow them all over the place. Obviously, that's not part of our technology, but it allows us, it allows the microphone to capture the speaker in its best possible place and make slight adjustments to the low position so that even if we move around in the room, the sound is picked up properly and sent off to the site. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. I hope that the video has been helpful to you to understand the differences in the pickups and to hear the differences in the three different solutions that we've presented, of course, in comparison to a base microphone. And I hope that you've enjoyed it. We've got two other videos that I would invite you to watch, one in a smaller room and one in a medium-sized room. And until then, take care. Thank you, William. Yes, thank you, William. So, the next room demo we're going to look at is the medium-sized room. Uh, William invited us to watch the video. And before we do, I'll just have a quick resume of what it looks like for you. Uh, again, a picture of the actual room where the video was recorded. Slightly smaller than the previous one, now only space for 10 people. It's just over six meters long, three meters wide, and it's the same sort of ceiling height, just under three meters high. Glass walled, in this case, down one side. It's important to note there's a very hard surface on the table and a hard wall surface. So the acoustics in this room are slightly different to the conference room we just saw. Let's uh, watch the video and see how it goes. Hello and welcome to Shore. Today we're coming to you from a medium-sized room. Again, in this series of videos, we have chosen three different rooms, very typical, metal walls, metal false ceiling, typical wooden melamine tables, in order to present our MXA solutions to you in very typical rooms with very little acoustic treatments. We have chosen a very basic webcam and using the microphone from the webcam as a baseline for you. And then we are also recording simultaneously the output of four different solutions in this room. We have got MXA 310 solution on the table. We've got on the ceiling both an MXA 910 solution and an MXA 710 solution. And in this room, we're also using an MXA 710 linear array horizontally underneath the TV. Okay, to start off, we've got the MXA 310s located in the tables. The MXA 310s are configured with three lobes each in a cardioid pattern in order to cover the table appropriately. The output, the six lobe outputs, are then being routed via Dante to a P300. The P300 does the processing, the auto mix, and we are taking a single feed out of that audio P300, sending it off to the computer for recording, and that is what you are listening to. For the MXA710 linear array microphone placed on the ceiling, we have configured it out of the box, ceiling mount, with five lobes covering the entire table. Those five lobes are being sent to a Shure DSP, the P300. Again, the P300 does the auto mix, noise reduction, and that feed is then sent off to the computer and recorded, and that is what you're listening to now. We are also in this room using an MXA 910 seeming array microphone, of course. The MXA 910 is configured with eight lobes around the table. Again, the eight lobes are being fed via the Dante network to a P300, 
P300 does the auto mix, and we've sent that off to the uh, PC in order to be able to record it. Lastly, in this room, we are using the MXA710 linear array microphone. We have placed it horizontally underneath the screen. MXA710 in this case is very limited with only a few lobes oriented towards the room. And we're actually using the auto mix out of the MXA710, bypassing a P300, and that is being sent directly to the PC and being recorded. The purpose of these demos is actually in order to allow you to listen to our different solutions in very, very typical rooms. We've got MXA310s on the table. We have MXA710s in the ceiling, MXA710 on the wall, MXA910 on the ceiling. But it's giving you many options depending on the type of room that you have, the architectural requirements in the room, so that you are not limited to the type of microphone that you can use. Of course, these microphones work great no matter where you are, no matter where you are located in the room, whether we're walking around, whether we're standing, whether we're sitting, they work fabulously. The MXA710s and the MXA910s with the autofocus technology will automatically follow and adjust the lobe's position so that if people are standing or sitting down, it will follow them and allow beautiful audio and great capture for the people that are speaking. Well, that concludes this video. Hopefully it's been helpful, educational, and it'll be able to help you choose the type of microphone that you can recommend to your clients. Don't forget to watch. We've got two other videos in this series, one in a larger room, one in a smaller room. And feel free to follow us on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Take care, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you, William. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, we've got one video left now, although he said there was two to watch. Uh, the small room demo and I will show you uh, same as before the interior of the room the photograph and then looking down on the plan view four meters wide by five meters a 20 square meter room uh, a slightly trapezoidal table uh, and in this room they've got uh, two large windows on one side uh, with the melamine table in the middle which is quite a large surface area uh, I don't know if you listened to the previous video on loudspeakers or headphones but I could clearly hear the difference between the different microphones and the webcam microphone uh, and the different quality and depending on where in the room he was. Uh, have a listen to that this time uh, as William takes us through a small conference room. Hello and welcome to Shore France. We're coming to you from the business sector of Paris, La Défense. In this room, the smallest of the three rooms that we have equipped with our MXA solutions, we have what we will call our small room, roughly four by six meters in size, seating for five to eight. We can squeeze eight people. We have the same as in the other two rooms. We've got metal drop ceiling, metal on some of the walls, windows that you can see on my right, and a typical wooden table pushed up against the wall, and we have two large screens. I think they're 65 inch screens. The MXA solutions that we have set up in this room, we have of course an MXA, a single MXA 310 more or less in the middle of the table. We have an MXA 710 four foot line array above our two screens and the MXA 910 ceiling array on the ceiling. To start with, the MXA 310. The MXA 310 placed in the center of the table, we have set it up with three different lobes one lobe facing the end of the table, and then a single lobe facing the two sides of the table. The MXA310 is then sent via the Dante network through a P300 and is recorded via a computer via the Dante network simultaneously with the two other solutions. We also, of course, have a webcam that is being used as a reference. The MXA710 and the MXA910 are routed directly from their auto mix out through the Dante network into the computer for the recording. We're using that fed directly because they have built-in IntelliMix circuitry with the noise reductor built right into the two microphones. We've placed the MXA710 four foot line array above the two screens because we have a PTZ video camera placed below. The MXA710 has been set up to cover both the width and the depth of the room and affords us nice freedom of movement no matter where we are in the room. The MXA910 has been placed up above on the ceiling. The 910 has been configured with a number of lobes around the perimeter of the table, easily covering the five to eight seats that we have here within, in this room. Also, the 910 with the autofocus, these lobes 
are able to move so that even if I come back to the far corner of the room, down to the whiteboard, no problems, picks up my voice comfortably and gives a really nice feed to the far side. I hope that you have found this video informative and you've gleaned a little bit of information from us. Please follow us on social media and uh, don't forget to watch the other two videos, medium room, large room. See you later. Thank you very much, William. So now we've seen the three rooms, small, medium and large. William went around the rooms and we're listening to the different microphone solutions uh, recorded simultaneously and he switched between them and we could hear the difference in, in timbre and quality and especially the webcam was very different. Didn't really explore though when not to use the microphones in what situation. Uh, Geraint, yep. could you help me out a little bit about this one? When, when would we not want to use some of these microphones? Well, I mean, uh, the videos obviously were uh, set up for the demonstration purposes, but you wouldn't necessarily cram in as many microphones as you could into one room. And so um, it's important to use the right microphone uh, for the right room. And I guess uh, it would come down to essentially three choices, three things to consider, I would say. And one of those would be the quantity. Simply, how many microphones do you need? The placement, where would you put them? And the aesthetics, does it suit the room? Is there something to consider that uh, is out of your control? So if we go into a bit more detail on that, the quantity consideration, as you said earlier, Julian, uh, microphones are like ears. And they can only hear so far, a bit like me. And uh, usually uh, I find it much easier to hear somebody when they're stood right next to me. So you might want to think about that when you consider how many microphones you might need. If it's a larger room, uh, you might need a, a number of microphones to provide the proximity uh, to the voices. You would want to consider the coverage. So if you're just looking at maybe picking up the table, then would you necessarily need to fill the whole room with microphones? Or if you do actually want to fill the room because maybe there's a presentation going ahead, then there's a consideration needed to uh, put, a, put a microphone in um, where you believe the presentation might be being held. Um, at the end of the day, um, you don't want somebody to be walking away from the microphone and not be heard very well, even if the microphone does hear, does pick them up. Um, you would have to would, you would have to consider the limit of that uh, of that one microphone. Naturally, uh, the placement will determine where in the room. So, you might want to look at what the um, requirements or limitations where the client may tell you that they don't particularly want a microphone so uh, they might not want to see a microphone in which case putting the 910 on the ceiling uh, means that they have a nice uh, clear room where they can't see things uh, or they might have a, a television on the wall and that would be their preferred location uh, because it's all put on one, in one area, one location. So if any engineers need to go in or if the, uh, the users need to interact with it, it's all in one place. You could also be dealing with uh, some very fussy uh, architects or designers and they don't particularly like their, uh, their, <laughs> their wondrous visions being uh, ruined by uh, additional hardware being hammered in somewhere. So. Um, again, you might want to consider the, the various options depending on uh, how, uh, well, let's not say fussy, but how, uh, how proud the uh, designer is of their room. So, for example, yeah, you wouldn't want to put something on the wall or the ceiling, so maybe the only choice then is to put a 310 on a table or, as I said, the 710 next to the TV, which is kind of already there. Um, Drilling is expensive, and especially if you're working with something like a listed building, um, you don't want to do all the paperwork. Uh, so rather than drilling into walls or defacing uh, some uh, Victorian uh, 
you know, fascia or something, then maybe put something on the ceiling is the right option. And you also want to think about the uh, the way the room is being used, what it's used for. So, for example, if the meetings are generally uh, held by people who like to make notes, who drink a lot of coffee, um, like I do, then you wouldn't necessarily want a microphone right next to people slamming down books or putting down coffee cups because that could uh, really kind of ruin the uh, the experience that people are having with with that meeting. And as we said, aesthetics, uh, what do you want the room to look like? Um, it could just be that it's uh, very kind of clean lines, uh, white space, uh, meeting room, or actually it could be a cosy, um, technologically um, involved room. So uh, the microphone might answer a question on, on the aesthetics, uh, whether you want that clean look. Or some people, they, they love their technology and they want to show off and the, uh, you know, the, the 710 looks pretty cool on the, on the wall or the 910 in the ceiling is, is something that they, they're quite happy to, to kind of identify and show off. Um, ultimately, uh, work with your clients, work with the integrators and, and just uh, see what, what the preferred option is and which microphone meets, meets those requirements. I just want to add there, Geraint, that you mentioned in your history tour 2020, and you nearly mentioned the C word. I'm not going to mention it now, but there is often nowadays a trade between placement and aesthetics where HR would like to have something out of reach that cannot be touched, uh, whereas the architect would like something in view that you can see and can be touched. And of course, if it's out of sight uh, and can't be touched, then it doesn't need sanitization. So that's another consideration which is very uh, modern in the true sense of the word. Absolutely. And again, it can come down to how maybe also how uh, technically savvy your clients are. They may not want to interact too much with the technology because they fear it. Or uh, if you're working in some uh, IT uh, company who love their gadgets, they love the interaction and they might want to get their hands on things. So it, it can also come down to um, the just the end client's preference, uh, as well as any kind of uh, health considerations, shall we say. Um, now, we've, we've talked about uh, fitting into a uh, the client's expectations, but we should probably discuss what makes um, a, a non-ideal room. And of course, you're all probably way ahead of me on this, but the answer is reverb uh, really does affect um, the, the ability for the microphone to, to cope in a room. Uh, it's what we would describe as the limiting factor over the quantity placement and aesthetics of a room. That's so, right, Geraint. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> You're right, the quantity, the aesthetics and the placement, that's all fine. We were just talking about it in very ideal terms. The average room, and we've just seen that in the video, four walls, one floor, one ceiling. They are boxes, they are designed for human use, uh, that's it. The combined reflectivity of the surfaces in the room are what determine the reverberation time of the room, and it's the reverberation time that helps muddy the sound, if you like. It loses the intelligibility of the speech. It makes people tired, makes them fatigued when listening in there. All surfaces are reflective to some extent. And here I'm talking about acoustic reflection. Of course, they're also reflective to light. That's how we see them. Uh, in a way, you could say that a, a fully absorbent surface that, that absorbs all the light is black. Usually, it's also very good at absorbing sound, not strictly true all the time. I'm just going to run through what I mean by reflective. But I've got here a piece of material. Uh, I haven't defined what it was. It doesn't really matter what it is. There is a, a sound planar wave incoming. When it hits the material, some of it is reflected back. Uh, I've shown it here coming off at an angle, but uh, it comes off. It depends on the surface itself, whether it's diffuse or uh, planar like a mirror, but I've shown it coming directly back here. 
notice the width of the arrow going in is it has one width and that coming out is slightly less because I'm trying to show you that some of the energy would actually go through the material. So if you were standing on the other side of the material or had your ear pressed to it, you would be able to hear the sound hitting it. Uh, and then lastly, a little red arrow in the material to show that some of it gets absorbed by the material itself uh, as heat. So the molecules in the material are, are being hit by the sound wave and get dissipated as heat. And in a room, it's the highly reflective surfaces that are giving the reverberation and giving us problems for the room acoustics. Here I've taken the same diagram. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see another material, highly reflective. The sound incoming is the same one as before. Almost all the energy is being reflected back into the room. Only a little bit is being dissipated as heat and only a little bit is being transmitted through. So in this case, if you were in that room and, and you were speaking at the surface, the sound will be coming back at you, uh, but slightly delayed because it takes time. And if that happens several times in a room, you're going to get an echo, uh, it's going to be confused, uh, and the sound will not be as crisp as it could be. The one on the right, same size of material, but it's actually a different composition. The incoming ray is the same. Notice the reflective one now has very much less energy because a lot of it is being dissipated as heat in the material itself and a little bit transmitted through. So this might be. Uh, uh, something that is porous that is able to set the sound into it and won't let it out again. And here are some examples of reflective surfaces. Glass, I think that's fairly obvious. It's fairly flat and it's, it's sharp uh, in the sound. The way you can do that, if you take, for example, a, a pen, I can take a uh, fountain pen, that's enough fountain pen, a, a biro here. If I attack the desk I'm sitting at, it's quite a high pitched sound and it would be the same as glass. If I tap myself, you can hardly hear it. I'm absorbing the sound and translating into heat. If I do this long enough, it will get red there. But the table is high. So the, the glass is like, like the table here, reflective surface and the sound is coming back off it. Concrete, very similar to glass, very massive, dense material. The sound was gonna reflect off it, is not going to go through or get absorbed. Likewise, stone, ceramics, anything basic. If you hit it and it makes a high pitch sound, it's going to reflect. Absorbent surfaces, on the other hand, uh, a dry wall, jip rock, usually with an airspace behind it before it hits the next surface, that will absorb sound very well. If you if you knock the wall, you can hear straight away whether it's going to be highly reflective or an absorbent wall. Wood, although I said I'm tapping my table here, that's wood. If I was tapping something that was a little bit sharper, it makes even a higher sound. So the wood is, is absorbent, not fully, but better than nothing. And then lastly, on my example here, fabric lined. Uh, if you have a room that is giving you trouble and you want to absorb the stuff, then line it with fabric, like myself. I'm lined with fabric, I'm absorbing the sound. That's the physics. How does this reverb affect the, the microphones we have in the room? Well, let's have a look here. We have a, a nine uh, MXA 710 from the ceiling. This microphone is susceptible to reverb. It's the most in the range we have. And the reason for that is that the, the lobes, if you recall, I said were toroids, the donuts, they effectively see three surfaces. They can see two walls and a floor. So if we've got a shiny wall and a shiny floor and another shiny wall, the sound will be reflected off and, and the reverb could get annoying. So if two of the surfaces are reflective, it can compromise the uh, the acoustics in the room. But if there was a carpeted floor and there were some paintings on the wall and it was only the desktop that was slightly reflective, no problem. Here we've got uh, a room with an MXA 910 in, the one we've seen before with the lobes coming down. These are less susceptible to reverb because each lobe is typically looking down at one surface, which is the table, and perhaps it sees a little bit of the floor behind. So the ceiling and the walls are not having as much effect on the reverberation as far as the microphone is concerned. Of course, there's still reverberation in the room. We're not magically sucking it away. If the surface is highly reflective, like the table is a melamine polished white uh, and you tap it with your pen and you hear it's quite high pitched, it might compromise the sound. But think about it when the people are going in the room. Uh, they will absorb the sound themselves and also if they're putting paper on the table or bags or anything else, anything will absorb the sound or disturb the sound field, uh, will improve the acoustics. 
Never underestimate a room. If you test it and it's empty and it doesn't sound so good, when people get in there, miraculously it gets better because they are actually helping with the acoustics of the room. Lastly, the MXA 310. Uh, Geraint was talking about proximity. The 310 is less susceptible to reverb, and that's because the, the lobes are quite, I would say small, but they are contained. They would only see one surface, and that would be the one that's behind the person, typically the wall. And usually you're sitting quite close to it. So because it's so far away, the microphone is picking up the direct sound from you very quickly. And if there's anything reflecting off the wall, it's dampened and the, uh, the loss in the room uh, of the sound as it's going through the, uh, the air will, by the time it reaches the microphone, will be much, much less. So as it says here, if it's more than two meters away, it's probably not going to compromise the sound at all. So the MXA 310 is, is quite a good thing to use in a room that is quite reverberant. If you've got a very reverberant room, then you can get the microphone very close to the, uh, the people speaking. In this case, we're showing that the Microflex wireless uh, is not seeing any surface. You're only 20 to 30 centimeters away from the source, the people's voices, uh, and so it's a very clear sound. So it's a good technique if you've got a highly reverberant space and you're gonna get consistent sound. But of course, there's a lot more technology involved. There's more stuff for people to have in the room and does require a different sort of configuration if you're using wireless as opposed to having a wired system. So we've got reverb, we understand that in a room it changes depending on the, the surfaces in the room and the, the kind of material and furnishings and how many people are there. If you've got a room which has controlled acoustics, it might be a studio or it just might be a boardroom which tend to have plusher furnishings, a deeper pile carpets, uh, wooden tables which are not uh, which are not melamine, which is say they're hardwood. In a control that you could use the MXA 710. It's very discreet. It could be hidden in all sorts of places, uh, and that's absolutely fine. In a larger space where the uh, and this is very typical, it's uh, a corporate space where the floors need to be cleaned regularly, so you can't have carpets. There's something to be washed. Same with the tabletop surfaces. You might want to have some wall treatments, some acoustic paneling. There might be curtaining. Uh, the MXA 910 is very good for that. The room is becoming more reverberant. We're moving then closer to the, the microphone. Use the MXA 310, and then that is by the, the fact that you're far away from the walls relative to the microphone to mouth distance, you're going to reduce the reverberation. And then lastly, uh, a gooseneck microphone or something similar where you're very close to the, the speaker themselves. Grind, I've come to the end of my little spiel on reverberation and the different choice of microphones. What yeah, have we you. learned and what have you learned? Yeah, well, um, well, I mean, I don't think uh, too many people would have expected to have learned a little bit of Welsh and some uh, physics today. But uh, hopefully one of the key takeaways uh, that we, we, can all, uh, we can all have is that um, each microphone uh, provides a very good quality option and uh, solution uh, to uh, the audio uh, needs for the room. But we could say that the 910 uh, would be the best sounding of the lot. I think we could all agree on that. Uh, but obviously only if that's a suitable solution for the room itself. We've learned about how it's important that the number of uh, microphones in the room uh, is is equally important as where the placement and the aesthetics uh, of that particular room are, and that should inform your decision on uh, choosing the right microphone. Reverb uh, is ultimately the main factor to consider in determining which microphone to use. So um, yeah, a little bit of physics and a little bit of lo local knowledge uh, is needed to uh, help uh, make a decision on that. And then to try and help control that reverb, uh, we need to consider options such as soft furnishings and even surfaces and potentially trying to hide any highly reflective uh, panes such as uh, window well, sorry, panes such as window panes. And that would go a long way to helping. And uh, finally, we've learned that by doing all of these things that we actually provide a pleasant environment in order to hold meetings and webinars and um, as you said, sometimes poor audio can be one of the main reasons why people get bored in meetings and not the content, obviously. 
So, <laughs> um, so hopefully uh, we've all learned something today and it's been uh, useful to you all. And uh, just leaves us to say thank you very much for your time. Um, appreciate we've maybe gone over slightly, um, but uh, if you have any questions, um, we should have a bit of time to answer them. If not, then we will get back to you uh, with an email. All right, everybody. We hope you enjoyed that video rebroadcast. Um, I have been asked to share this slide with you, so I'm going to put that up on the screen right now. Oop, pardon. Let me get the right slide up here. Give me just a moment. Okay, great. All right, I have been asked to show you this slide. Um, please note, uh, we will not be an answering any questions uh, regarding the content on this slide. If you do have any questions or want to follow up and you are in the U.S., you can go to the MXA 910 page on sure.com and there is a link to more information. But I'm just going to leave this slide up on the screen for just a few moments. Okay, hopefully you all had a chance to see that if you needed to, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to ask my uh, co-presenters to join me uh, for any questions. And we don't have very many, um, so we should be able to get through with this pretty quickly. Welcome back, William and Jeff. All right, here we go. Uh, first question here, um, why don't we make the speakers in the same form factor as the mics? Good question. I, we can always bring that back towards uh, marketing and PDD, I guess, to make a, uh, a speaker in the same form factor as the MXA um, 910. Not a bad idea at all. We can, uh, we'll bring that back to uh, the design and marketing team. All right, great. And this next question actually isn't about MicroFlex Advance, um, but since we have the time, I'll present it. It's actually about uh, MicroFlex Complete Wireless. Um, we have the MXCW, and we think they are amazing. One of the harder problems we have faced is only one voting question at a time. Is there an option coming to do multiple questions upon needs? The other item we noticed was connecting to the iPad via app is not available or is not working. No direct information of video guideline for this product as such a highly advanced and wonderful unit. Gentlemen, anything? Uh, yeah, what, I'm curious on the iPad question. What What is that referring to? Um, maybe they can clarify. Um, there's not necessarily an iPad app uh, for that. So, um, yeah, as far as features with the MXCW, uh, you know, the standard answer, we're constantly improving our products and whatnot. So, um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what, again, what the... Could you repeat that or read back that question? Sure. Um, Regarding the voting? Yeah, they, they, the problem that they're facing is that there's only one voting question at a time. So I'm guessing that's a feature set that is not currently supported. Um, and yeah, and as Jeff said, we can't really right. talk about our product developments, but we are always working to expand and improve, and we'll make sure we let the product teams know that that is a suggestion. And then I would say, uh, furthermore, if you're having additional um, issues or anything specifically you need to work through, um, you can actually reach the teams that these gentlemen are on by visiting sure.com slash contact and filling out that form. That will open up a support ticket, and they can talk you through any sort of uh, technical issues that you're having with any of our products. Um, so we've got a great team of guys and gals there. Um, okay, here we go. Follow-up. Uh, so on the iPad, we log into the website but an app would be very helpful. It states uh, we can send the feature to a larger screen. Okay, so they, uh, maybe they're just logging into the to the web GUI uh, via an iPad. Um, yeah, if yeah, if you maybe send us an email with kind of what you're looking to do or what what specifics are getting getting you hung up, uh, we could definitely uh, send it to the team to figure out what what. Uh, what the solution is or if there is one. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, next question, um, it says, can we use, I'm, I'm 
I'm assuming this is regarding the MXA910. Can we use all the eight lobes uh, irrespective of models for camera control? So I guess sort of a question about lobes and camera control. I can address that if you want, Jeff. Um, yeah, go ahead. So the, the short answer is yes. Um, after that, there's a lot of uh, parameters involved in doing using our MXA910 to do camera tracking. It is absolutely possible to do it. I've done it around our offices in Paris um, using a full eight lobes, driving a single camera with three presets. Um, I've been in boardrooms where there are multiple MXA910s um, being controlled by either AMX, Crestron, um, Xtron, as far as controllers recalling presets. So it absolutely is possible to do. It, uh, it can be involved. There's some programming behind it. The acoustics of the room will play into it as far as um, how well it works, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but it's absolutely doable. Yeah, and I'll add uh, sometimes, though, the uh, audio and the camera needs are def different where you want like a tighter, if you want to pick up one person, you're going to need a narrow lobe uh, specifically put to where that person is. Uh, so again, it, those can be in conflict with each other if depending on how you, you want to do it. You, and then you, if, you, if you're not using all eight lobes in the, MXA910, you could use uh, extra lobes just for camera control, and uh, all of those uh, commands get spit out by the the, the microphone. So you're just going to be listening uh, for when those those uh, uh, lobes get gated on, and then are gated off, uh, and then fire that off to the camera uh, control. Great, awesome, thank you, John. If that makes sense. Oh, got another one that just popped in. Um, can we use the MXA 910 or 710 series in conference rooms with local sound reinforcements? And if yes, how does DSP manage feedback here? So I'm guessing this is a voice lift question. Voice lift question, yes. Results may vary, you know, typical answer. Uh, yeah, depending on your room acoustics, what uh, if you have the ability to zone out your speakers, uh, that's ideal. And the, that's the beauty of the uh, MXM 5C uh, is that you essentially have uh, an unlimited amount of zoning your speakers. However many speakers you have, that's how many zones you have. Uh, but yeah, so it's uh, a lot of it is manage, managing expectations. Are you looking for reinforcement, which is you know kind of the voice of God thing, or are you looking to just replace the the level that's lost over distance? Uh, so uh, the nine ten will have a much uh, higher level of success with that uh, just due to the nature of its directivity. Um, the 710, it is possible. Uh, I've been told I have not yet uh, done it. I'm in a room where we are about to try that out. So um, again, uh, it, results will vary, uh, but yeah, it's, it, there's a fair amount of uh, due diligence um, going into that running standard PagNag to even see if it's feasible. So. Yeah, I and I would we, definitely invite you to go to our website, do a search for voice lift. There's a white paper that has been published on the website. It's got lots of great information, including the PagNeg, and there's a link for the, the PagNeg calculator in order to, and it'll explain what exactly is the PagNeg in order to uh, give you a good uh, heads up on that. Yeah, and I will say that I think, I think uh, the, the 910 will, will bode a little bit better than the PagNeg because uh, that's based off of standard PagNag, and the, the 910 is a little bit of a different animal. So, uh, But I, I would say be conservative, probably go with the, the calculator that is online. Great. All right, next question. Can the MXA310 be ceiling mounted in a small room? No. <laughs> you Simple can. Answer. You can do it, but don't do it. We don't um, recommend yeah, it. That, that might, yeah, it's it's... It, it's essentially like a, a if you're familiar with PZM uh, pr pr pressure zone microphone. It's it's uh, similar to that, but but yeah, the 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 310 is definitely not designed to go on a ceiling. Um, that being said, if you know you you have success with it and figure it out, more power to you. But 
Uh, but yeah, we probably wouldn't recommend doing it that way. <laughs> all right. And I believe that wraps up all our questions. So thank you so much, William and Jeff, for joining and answering questions. And thank you all, you all so much for joining the webinar today. We hope you learned a little something. And we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Take care, everyone.